Hi, I'm Kevin Chien, the director of the Revere Public Library, and I'm here with uh, local author Leo J. Maloney, who will be launching his third book at the Romney Marsh Academy Auditorium on Saturday, September 6th. Leo has served as a deep cover black operative for a clandestine government agency accepting highly secretive missions throughout the world. He has also served as a police officer and is a licensed private investigator in Massachusetts. Leo has acted in independent films and TV commercials, and he has several movies to his credit, either as an actor, producer, or technical advisor. Leo's first novel, Termination Orders, was published by Kensington Publishing in 2012. The second book in the Dan Morgan thriller series, Silent Assassin, was released in August 2013. The third book in the series, Black Skies, is due for release in August 2014. And a novella, 12 Hours, will be released in March 2015. He has spoken at the library in my town of Billerica, and unfortunately um, I had to miss that one. And he's also spoken in Stoneham, Draca, Quincy, and the Boston Public Library, and as, as well as others. So thank you for, for coming. Thank you for having me. Um, for, you have such a uh, wealth of experience here. I have to rely on my notes. I, I apologize. No, no problem. You are a black ops veteran with over 30 years of experience in the field. What led you from the clandestine world of espionage to becoming a writer? Well, during my career, uh, especially in the later years, uh, my, my partner and I had talked about writing a book together when we both retired. Unfortunately, he passed away in 1997. And then when I retired in 2001, I had basically given up on the idea. But once I told my immediate family what I really did, for a living because nobody knew that was part of what I did. Nobody could knew it was for my protection as well as theirs. So after my telling them and after them getting up off the floor, <laughs> they started to ask me questions about it. And there were certain things I could talk about and certain things that I couldn't and certain things I wouldn't. So I, I began telling them things that I thought that I could tell them and that they might find interesting. And at, at some point in time, uh, my uh, my wife really started to talk to me about, you should write a book, you should write a book. And I kept saying, no, I don't want to write a book, I don't want to write a book. Uh, I didn't have any formal training as a writer, mm -hmm. and I just thought it would be a lot of headaches that I didn't need. I was retired and wanted to enjoy my retirement. And, uh, you know, shortly thereafter, I, I began telling some of my friends, and then my wife told some of our friends, and then I told my daughter. So they really got on me about I should write a book. So this was in 2001 or 2002. <clears throat> excuse me, in 2007, I finally gave in and decided I would write a book. But what I decided to do was write it as fiction, but based on certain events that took place in my career. So in every book, this I dropped something in there that actually took place, but without dating it. Um, uh, when I when I signed with Kensington in 2011, uh, we signed initially a two book deal with an option for seven more. So right now I'm into I've just completed my fourth, working on my fifth, and what they wanted me to do was um, not date the character. The, na the main character is Dan Morgan, mm -hmm. and that's uh, based on me, and uh, his code name was uh, Cobra, and uh, but they didn't want him dated. So what they've allowed me to do is. Uh, when I write, I can take things that are happening in today's world. And I found that I had a knack for taking facts, mixing them and creating with fiction, and creating a pretty good story. So that's, you know, that's really how it all developed. And, you know, I then got, wound up getting an agent. And uh, once I got the agent, I, I also uh, had a ghostwriter who I still have. He's still with me. Uh, when we first started writing, I would sit and tell him stories for hours. And he'd be sitting there typing away and making notes. And, uh, but once we actually started the book, uh, I would write and send him stuff. And oh, we'd sit together and I'd give him things that I, you know, I felt needed to be in there. So for the first book, Termination Orders, it was probably a, um, I'd say, 80-20. He wrote 80% of it, 
twenty percent of it was mine, but the storylines were mine. I created the stories. Um, uh, the second book, Silent Assassin, it was probably close to a uh, sixty forty. The third book, Black Skies, it became probably he wrote or I wrote about sixty and he wrote about forty. So we started to flip it. And on the fourth book, Twelve Hours, it was about uh, eighty twenty. Oh, okay. So over the years I've learned uh, I've taken classes and attended different seminars and I and I've learned how to write. But with that being said, I still want him with me because he can take things. He's the, he's the train writer. He graduated uh, Yale University. He's an experienced writer. And, you know, I'll keep him. I'll always keep him. We work together very well. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he's great about my ideas. We've never had a harsh word with each other. So that's really how it all came about. Oh, that's great. So, uh, for example, something that is set in Afghanistan in 2002 could have taken place back in the 80s. In other words, you're taking real events and changing them around, making them fiction. Yeah, I, 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 when, I, when I talk about uh, uh, things in the Middle East, uh, it was at times that I was there, but I'm not dating things. And when I do write about things, because everything I, I write is in today, I do research to check and see what's changed. Because, you know, some places I haven't been in 20, 25 years, you know, uh, so things do change a little. Mm -hmm. So I just check and make sure that if I'm going to talk, talk about a specific area that, you know, I know what I'm talking about and that it hasn't changed. And I say something and some will go, oh, no, that's wrong. That's not there. You know, because things do change. Mm -hmm. So, you know, my research itself, yeah, when I research a book, my, my first three books, I did... Uh, didn't do a great deal of research, only updating stuff. Uh, the storylines in, in the books itself came from here, came from mm -hmm. experiences and things that I had either done myself, seen, uh, things like that. But the fourth book, which was the uh, novella, which comes out in March, called 12 Hours, that's actually done in a lifetime. And uh, I did a ton of research for that. I actually went to New York and spent several days in New York doing research uh, about Penn Station, Grand Central Station, and the Waldorf. And I learned uh, really a, a lot of things about New York and about those particular venues that I didn't know about. And they all have a, a major, uh, a, a part of the major plot lines in the book. Mm -hmm. So that was pretty interesting. I did enjoy doing the research. And, uh, you know, I, I like being out in the street learning things. Speaking of being out in the street, you were also a police officer as well as a private investigator and a movie actor. Um, and as well as a black operative. Uh, which of your many careers have you found the most uh, fulfilling, personally fulfilling? Well, I'd say my black operative career. Um, what I did as a black op, uh, I was a contractor. So by that, it allowed me to accept or refuse assignments as I so choose. And when I took, took an assignment, initially when I began working, I took assignments that I thought was in the best interest of our country. And it's something that I had to feel strongly about. If I didn't, I'd just say no, and that was the end of it. But as time went on, and I, um, had a, I have a daughter, and once she was born, I kind of decided I wanted to do things that I felt was in the best interest of her future, um, and then the country. And, you know, when I did things, I, I always did them that I really had strong feelings about that it was the right thing to do and that I would make a difference, or at least hoped I would make a difference. Sometimes I did, sometimes it didn't. Um, sometimes there were just scenarios where there were things that would happen that if someone interfered uh, one way or the other, it, it changed things. So, but overall, that, that, and it also got me, I traveled, I traveled the world. I've seen things, been places, and experienced things that most people will never have the opportunity to do. Um, and, and I think that's, you know, you throw all those things in, it's been quite an interesting life. <laughs> it sure has. Um, I can only imagine. <laughs> or, and read your, your books. Well, it's the, if, when you read the books, you, you, you're going to, I tell people, when they read them, 
they're going to see things and they're going to say, is this real? Is that real? And I tell people, if, if once you've read the book, if you really want to know, if you email me, I'll most likely tell you, I'll answer your question. Unless you ask me something that I just can't or won't talk about. But most of the time, people ask me, you know, reasonable questions, I'll answer them. And usually tell them what's true and what isn't. Wow. Um, well, can you share us any interesting stories or anecdotes from your experience? And please don't say, you'll have to kill me. <laughs> uh, well, you know, I don't talk about my missions. I very rarely bring anything up about the missions. But there were times when I was not on a mission, but in different parts of the world, and got to, ex again, got to experience things that a lot of people don't, like uh, uh, we were in uh, Monte Carlo, and I got to see one of the uh, Formula One races. We also were in the, cas we went to the casinos a lot, and, you know, I got to see some really high rollers, and I got to see some, you know, people, uh, major, major players. I also got to, got to meet uh, a lot of uh, political people um, who they never knew who I was, but I got to meet them and, and got to interact with them. So, and we went to some, you know, we went to some really, uh, some huge uh, political fundraising balls and things like that, uh, which also was pretty interesting. Mm. So it wasn't all work. There were times when, you know, we were down times when we got to do things and go to places and see things that, you know, we normally wouldn't have done if, as a normal citizen. Um, so, um, you've already talked to, you already answered my question about the research that you've done. Um, you know, that, that's, um, have, is there anything particularly, uh, you mentioned the New York and, uh, this, uh, the Penn Station. Um, have you ever dug up any other, um, interesting information, uh, in your research? Yeah, well, l let's go back to New York. Um, um, when I did my research, um, for Grand Central Station, I was lucky enough to meet a guy, he was a, called the train master. He was an old timer and he worked for Grand Central Station. He's been there forever. And he took uh, myself and a, a very good friend of mine, Dr. Jones, who had gone with me, and he took us on a private tour of Grand Central Station. And he showed us things and took us places that the public doesn't know about, the general public doesn't know about and will never see. Uh, we were down as far as nine levels down underneath. Um, we also saw what they call the war room. If there's a major incident, everyone goes into that war room, all the um, uh, police, various police authorities and uh, fire authorities, and, and, and they have monitors. It's, it almost looks like it belongs to the FBI or the CIA. With It's just ultra-modern. Um, he also took us down into the basement, and he showed us uh, this area where there were some machines, and and I can't think of off the top of my head what they were called, but um, during World War II, the uh, Army had people uh, headquartered at Grand Central Station, and these machines that ran uh, were a type of generator that if they went down, it would shut down the transit system on the East Coast, and a lot of the um, Army moved their people and their goods through the trains. So they actually had it under guard. And um, uh, these two machines, and they were huge, were so important that they were guarded 24-7. And if you had the misfortune of getting down to that basement, you would immediately be arrested and kept in prison during the rest of the war. And it didn't matter who you were. If you had the misfortune of getting, happened to getting by the guard for some reason, getting inside, you'd be shot on the spot. And the reason being because something as simple as sand could have taken these machine down. And actually, uh, during the war, Hitler sent, uh, had got information about these and sent four spies over to the U.S. They came over by submarine. And uh, it turned out that uh, two of them got his, two of them were caught relatively soon, um, uh, an off-duty, um, I believe it was Coast Guardsman, saw the sub and reported it. And two of them got picked up right away and, and went to prison. The other two actually made it to Grand Central Station and got down and were, one of them, I believe, was shot and the other one was, was arrested. Wow. Um, 
So that was pretty interesting. Yeah. And another major thing I found was he took us and showed us uh, President Roosevelt's private train. When Roosevelt would come into New York, it would, he would come into Grand, and then there was a, a special track that would take him underneath and take, uh, take him to uh, the Waldorf Astoria. And Roosevelt would have his Pierce Arrow in the vehicle, and because he had polio and he never wanted anyone to see him not walking, they would transport him in his vehicle uh, off the train, onto a platform, into an elevator that would take him 12 floors up to the presidential suite. So when I saw this train, it was marked, it, has, it still has initials on FDR. It sat, it's been sitting there oh, probably 50, 60 years at this point in time. But it, but it, was, it was pretty cool um, just seeing it and knowing the history of it. And, and there were some things on like uh, up top, I had noticed that there was some terrorists. And what they, would, they were things that held machine guns. The Secret Service had machine guns all around the train. So if the train was ever attacked, they could fight off the attack. And the other thing I noticed that underneath the train, there was this really, uh, it looked like a suspension system, but a spring system. But, you know, the guy, the, the train master didn't even know what it was. So I got underneath and I looked at it, and then I figured out what it was. What it was was they built a custom uh, system for him because he was crippled. And the trains back then didn't have the type of springs and cushioning they have. So what would happen is he'd be bouncing back and forth. Like a like a rag doll, so these things were stabilizers, oh, wow. which prevent him from going back and forth. I, I found that pretty interesting, um, and he didn't know that, but I figured out what it was, and then I actually looked it up, and that's what it was. Wow. I was right about him, so th I thought that was pretty cool, and just the whole underground thing and seeing all the various. And there's some things I can't talk about that he asked me not to, uh, but it was it was it was two days of, and we were there probably eight hours each day. I mean walking through places that you never even dreamed about exist. There's a whole city underneath Grand Central, which people don't realize. Oh. Now, were, were you able to do that through your contacts as a black operative or your credentials as an author? You mean the tour? Yes. Well, what happened was um, I, I had called Grand Central Station, and I said I'd be interested in getting some information, and they oh. connected me with this guy. So when I spoke to him, <clears throat> His name is uh, Daniel Brucker. Nice guy. But when I spoke to him, I told him that I was an author and that I was going to be doing a story about New York and the Grand Central was going to be part of it. And I'd like to know if he could give me some insight. And, and you know, uh, he said, yeah. And, but then when I went down and I met him, um, I never told him anything about my being a former black operative until I asked to get up into the train and look at where the where they had the mountings for the weapons. And then when I looked underneath and I told and he kind of looked at me and says, how do you know what they were? So that's when I told him. I said, I'm a former black operative. And um, that's how I knew. But he was great. Um, he, very flamboyant. Very flamboyant. Mm -hmm. But really knowledgeable. And he was just great. you know. And, and uh, he, the other thing he said to me was, there were a couple of things he said, please don't talk about. Or if you talk about them, disguise them differently. Like, for instance, there was one spot that he took me. And as we're walking, he pointed out a button on the floor and I'm not going to tell you the color of it or where it was but he said if you if someone hits that button it shuts down the entire and I mean the entire transit system in New York and it takes 45 minutes to get it back up Wow! so you know <laughs> those are the type of things that I thought were pretty cool wow. so what are you reading now <clears throat> well who are your favorite authors Oh, I've got a, I've got a few. Um, I just finished reading uh, End Games by John Gilstrap. Um, he's a New York Times best-selling author. He's also an author with Kensington. Oh. And John and I met uh, three years ago, and he's kind of taken me under his wing and really helped me through this whole process. And uh, he's he's got a series, um, uh, and uh, the last book in the series that I read was called End Games. Uh, uh, Jonathan. And I cannot remember the, the character's last name. Jonathan Graves, I believe it was. Um, again, it's it's a, it's it's similar to the type of stuff I write. Mm -hmm. um, he's good. He's 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 been a multi New York Times bestselling author. I've also just completed uh, a book called Retribution by a former uh, 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 a marine uh, a marine lieutenant colonel. Uh, 
and he's also a Kensington author. We just met in July, and um, I just finished reading his book, which was excellent. It's called Retribution. And um, I also, uh, I've read a lot of, uh, uh, I've read Ben Coe's, another New York Times bestselling <laughs> author, and he's from Wellesley, Mass. I've read uh, Hank Philippi Ryans, mm -hmm. who, who's also a local author. Hank's a bestselling author, as is Ben Coe's. Michelle McPhee, another best-selling author. I've read a couple of her books. And I've read, uh, as I say, a lot of Clancy's. And I've read uh, quite a few of Vince Flynn's book. Vince Flynn is another New York Times best-selling author who passed away. But uh, a great writer. Mitch Rapp was his character. And uh, just a, a great character. And by the way, Jonathan Graves is the name of Gilstrap's main character. Okay. And, um, you know, so th those, are the, those are the ones I read. Um, you know, I, I read I read some of Lee Child stuff. Uh, as a matter of fact, Lee Childs is going to be giving me a blurb on my 12-hour book. Oh, great! Um, yeah, that's that's pretty cool. I'm sorry, um, I'm writing these down because I want to make sure that we have some of these. I, mean, I know that we have um, Gilstrap, uh, I'm, but I want to make sure that we have the others. Yeah, they're uh, they're really you know those, those are the main characters. I don't have a lot of time. I read those because they're people that I've met and most of them have blurred me on my books, on the covers of my book, Meg Gardner, John Gilstrap, Hank Philippi Ryan, mm -hmm. uh, Michelle McPhee. And I read them because, you know, they do things to me, and I, and, I, and, some, and I become fans of their work. I don't read much other than that because I just don't have time. I'm either writing or editing or on tour. I, you know, I do a lot of touring um, in bookstores, and, and I do a lot of libraries around uh, different parts of the country. So, you know, I'm very, really, and I get, I've met so many people over the last few years uh, that say to me, would you read my manuscript and let me know what you think? So I do, really do I do that, but I do do it. But I just don't have a lot of other time, so it's, that's, that's about it for the reading. So uh, can you tell us something that you've learned about the publishing industry? <sighs> I think the biggest thing I learned is when you think you're done, you've just started. And by that I mean when once my once I'm done the manuscript, um, I will send it in uh, to my editor. And uh, my publishing company is Kensington Publishing in New York, and my editor's name is Michael Hamilton. And you could not ask for a better editor. She's her and I have uh, we've become not only she's my boss, I'm her employee. We've become very good friends, and she's really guided me through the process. And she's great. Um, she doesn't, you know, I don't have to send them in something when I first start writing. I just write and then send it into them, which, which is the way I started out. So it's, she's great about that. Um, but then when she's edited, you know, she'll have suggestions and she'll send it back and, and indentations, you know, tell me what her suggestions are and I'll, I'll make the change or I'll tell her why I think it needs to stay that way. And then I'll send it back again, and then, of course, I'll get another, uh, another whole uh, edit will come back. And then I, once that's done, then uh, they'll send it. There'll be another editor where it goes to the copy editor, and they'll send it back to me again just to make sure that there's no, uh, nothing that I left out or spelling's correct or the, uh, you know, the periods and the commas are in the right place, that type of thing. And... Um, then once that done, once that's done, then really all the promotion stuff starts, and that's changed over the years. It used to be that the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, publishing company did everything. They do a lot, but they also expect the authors to promote their books. Mm -hmm. So I promote my books in a lot of different ways. Um, I advertise in, in particular places uh, that that uh, you know the people that read my genre will see. I uh, I do a ton of as I say, appearances, personal appearances. And, um, you know, these are all forms of advertisement. And the more you do, the whole trick in the beginning was obviously nobody ever heard of me. Well, thank God I'm in the position now where that's not true anymore. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've got a really good following. The books have done very, very well, and each book does better. Um, so, you know, you, you think there's a lot more to it. You, you're constantly promoting, whether it's interviews, whether it's personal appearances. It, it never stops, and it's one right after another. So it seems like you're always doing something. So just writing the book, mm -hmm. and you think you're done, you're really not. Well, that, that sounds great. In fact, um, 
you told me, um, I need to share, that your books have been optioned for uh, movies, um, which is yet another thing that, that has opened up for you. Yep, I've been lucky enough to have uh, uh, Termination Orders and Silent Assassin, Silent Assassin optioned uh, for movies by Amber Entertainment, which is a company that's based, uh, it's an entertainment company that's based in both L.A. and England, and uh, one of the uh, primary owners named Eileen Mazel um, came down with me and met with me last winter and told me they were interested in uh, taking my first two books and making them movies. She had actually been visiting up in Newburyport, went into Sam's Club, saw my Termination Autos book, bought it, read it, and then contacted my agent. And he set up a meeting, and she came down, and we went to lunch. And uh, the process began last December. Um, but at this point in time, we've got a deal in place. Um, the uh, screenplay is being written, and it's under process. You know, it's under, uh, hopefully, I don't have a date. Uh, this, uh, there's another thing. We, uh, there's a big process to this. First, you sign the option. Then once the option sign, uh, then they'll they got to get the money in place. Once the money in place, which we know it is for this, then what they'll do is they'll write a screenplay. Now, I know the screenplay is being written in, uh, in England, but they're going to shoot the movie in England. Um, once the screenplay is done, then they hire a director. Once the director is hired, the producer is in place, then they start their auditions. Once that's done, then they start their movie. So th the whole thing could take at least, from this point in time, I'm guessing approximately a year. It depends on how long the shoot takes. It could take anywhere from three to six months. And um, then once that's done, then it goes into editing. So I'm hoping it's, I'm hoping it, it, it's going to be out a year from this coming December. Wow. If not, then I, I, which will be 2015, mm -hmm. but if not, then the spring of 2016. It just depends on how well everything goes. But it's, it's, a, it's a process. It definitely wow. is a process. Um, do you have any advice for aspiring or struggling writers out there? Yeah, the first uh, bit of advice I would give them is uh, write a commercial book. Write something that's going to sell. And when you write a manuscript, send it out to two independent editors and have them read it. Don't ask your family. Don't ask your friends because they're going to lie to you. They're going to tell you it's good. <laughs> you want to know if it's really good or not because you don't want to waste your time and money if it isn't, uh, by sending it out to two, ind two separate independent editors, they're going to be honest with you and tell you continue or not continue. Uh, then the other thing you want to do is you want to get yourself um, an agent. And you, you have to find yourself a good agent who's, and you can do research and find out uh, what their strong, strong suit is if it's in your genre. And if you get yourself an agent, uh, once you do that, then it's their job to go and get you a book deal. I kind of backdoored this. It, it didn't go that way for me. Excuse me. I, I actually went to an event, and, and that's another thing. I go to many events throughout the country. I go to Thriller Fest, was one of, which is one of the biggest conferences for writers in the world, and it's in New York every July. And I go to Boucher Con, which is in different parts of the country. I go to Killer Nashville, which I'm going to Killer Nashville uh, next week. And that's a huge conference. And matter of fact, Silent Assassin is up for an award called the uh, Silver Falchion Award uh, for Best Book of the Year. And um, so I actually went to Thriller Fest with the idea of getting an agent. And when I went, I talked to three or four agents, and I thought I had one, but then it didn't work out. Uh, for whatever reasons, it didn't work out. So I said, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to self-publish. Huh. And... I did. I self-published, and uh, uh, because of my, uh, I had a lot of different cover stories when I was a black opera. One of them was being an antique classic custom car broker, which allowed me to travel the world, and uh, another one, I owned a promotions company. I owned several companies, but the companies turned into be businesses, and I learned a lot from them. So I decided that I would self-publish, and then I knew how to promote. So I surrounded myself with people in the book industry who had been there, and I got a graphic designer. I got a guy that had uh, edited. I got a, he got me a company that uh, actually printed the book there up in Canada, and I got these out there. And I went to my local uh, Wall Green 
store and spoke to the manager and said that I was a local guy and I self-published a book, would they consider taking it on the consignment? And he asked me for the book. I let him take it. He read it. Called me back two days later and said, uh, I've got you in nine Walmarts in Massachusetts, but I've also talked to corporate, and you're going to be in 26th throughout the country. So I got my books out there. Then I got them in something called a paper store. Then I got them in various other independent bookstores throughout the country. So because I promoted, I knew how to promote, I really got it out there. And I got in my local publicity uh, publicist, which is Sky Wentworth Publications, Sky got me interviews on local radio stations in Boston and newspaper interviews. So the, the book kind of took off. Different cover, different thing than it looks like now. Um, but then um, my now editor, uh, Michael, was down Cape Cod, went into a store that I had in down Cape Cod, picked it up, read it, called me like three days later mm -hmm. and asked me if I'd be interested in talking to them about a mainstream publishing deal. I said, okay, and that's how it took oh, that's, off. That's great. So the, the main, getting back to the, 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 someone that's writing, first of all, you really need to write what's good. If it isn't, if it isn't going to sell, then don't waste your time. But with all that being said, if you believe in what you're doing, don't let, some, don't let someone tell you you can't do it. Go for it and try to get with a mainstream publisher. And if, and if you do, then you're one of the lucky ones because there's a lot of people out there that have been writing for years and years and years. I was so lucky I did this. I wrote a book, and three years later, I mean, from the time I started writing to the time I got my first book out with a mainstream publisher was less than three years. That's, that's and that's unheard of. And now I've got a movie deal. Mm -hmm. I've been very, very lucky, very lucky. So, but don't give up the dream. Go for it. And you know, you don't want to. You don't want to have any regrets when you're a little older in life. Saying, "I wish I had. I wish I had." Go for it. That's great. Now, can you tell me um, your first book? Um, did Did you do a book launch at the Boston Public Library? Yes, my first launch was at the Boston Public Library. Okay. My second, which was for Termination Authors. Okay. My second launch was at the. Uh, uh, Stoneham Library. I, I live in Stoneham presently, and I think I know what you're going to get at, so I can cut you off. Uh, the reason I decided to do it in Revere was there was a couple of reasons. Uh, I had wanted to, but then my my uh, my uh, publicist at Kensington, because I have a local publicist and a national publicist at Kensington, and my editor both said, you know, you should really do your book launch in the city you grew up in. You know. You know, and I and I gave it a lot of thought, and you know I had I wasn't sure I wanted to, but I wasn't sure. So finally, uh, uh, I decided it really would be a good move. Um, I grew up in Revere. I was I, I was in Revere from the time I was born all the way until I was uh, uh, 19 years old. Then I then it was gone for a while, but then I was a, a cop in Revere. Um, so I know a lot of people. Um, I know a lot of people, both as uh, you know, just a regular guy, you know, people I grew up with. Plus, I know people from when I was a cop, uh, just in general. So I, I gave it a lot of thought, and that's actually when I came to see you and talked about, uh, you know, my doing the launch there, especially when it was my third book. And um, I just think overall, you know, I've had a lot of great memories from Revere. I grew up in Beachmont, mm -hmm. but I spent time in, you know, I spent, as I, as I, it, as I got a little older each time, I, I spread my wings. I was, I'd hang around Broadway Revere and knew a ton of people from that section. Up the other end of Broadway near the pool room, I knew people and hung around people from Shirley Ave, from the Point of Pines. So I, I've, I spent a lot of time in different parts of Revere and I have a, a lot of good memories as, as a child. Uh, uh, I remember the beach when mm -hmm. we were young, what it was like, nothing like it is today. Um, and there were just a lot of really good memories of, of places and people and friends that I made over the course of the years. So when everything was said and done, it made sense to come home. And um, I'm glad I did. Um, we wound up, it's going to be at the uh, Remini Marsh Academy. And I think it's going to be, uh, I think it's going to be a really good event. It, it has the potential to be huge. And it's, a, it's free. There's mm -hmm. no charge to come. And I, and I think people will enjoy, you know, I'm going to do some talking about the books, about my writing. Uh, there'll be a Q&A session. There'll be um, uh, people will be able to purchase the books. I'll be signing books. There'll be refreshments. As a matter of fact, I have a woman who I met a year ago 
who wanted to start a fan club for me. And she's an attorney. So she's, you know, she's pretty normal. I thought, you know, when she told me this, I, why do you want to do a fan club? But she's a big fan and she's read my stuff. So she's actually uh, uh, providing a, um, a cake. It's going to be the front, the top of the cake is going to be the front cover of the book. Wow. Which, yeah, pretty interesting. Yeah. So there'll be, there'll be refreshments there. I mean, it will give me a chance, hopefully, to see all the people that I haven't seen in, uh, you know, some people 30, 40, 50 years. And I think some people will come out of curiosity. Mm -hmm. Some people will come because we were friends and they haven't seen me for 40 years. Some people will come because they don't like me and want to <laughs> see what happened and hoping I'll, I'll screw up with the books. And, and then there'll be, I just think there'll be a lot of curiosity. But, you know, I think it'll be a good time. Everybody would enjoy themselves. When you have, when you tell people about your black ops career, do they ever have an "Oh, that explains it" moment? <laughs> yeah, some depending on who it is. Sometimes what they said to me, they'll look at me and go, "That makes sense. That's where you disappeared. That's why you weren't here. That's why." Because I'd be, I'd be gone a lot. I'd be, you know, gone for long periods of times. Not a lot of people, because you know, I, I, depending on who I'm talking to, it will depend on how much I say. I still keep everything close to the vest, and there's a lot of things that I won't talk about. And, you know, and there's a lot. Of, sometimes you meet people where, you know, they just don't grasp the whole thing, and and so it just depends on who it is. But it's nice when I do meet somebody, and they, and then you see that look on their face, like like I've met people go, you right. I didn't think you could read, let alone write. <laughs> and that, you know, so there's some, you know, there's some funny things that happen. I, I ran along, I ran up against some funny things over the past few years. Are you hoping some of your former teachers show up? <laughs> oh, I highly doubt if any of my teachers are alive. I mean, <laughs> really, I mean, I'm 67. You know, there might be a few here and there. Uh, matter of fact, I, uh, one of my teachers that I remember very well was uh, Joe DiCarlo. Uh, from Revere, used to be senator, and he was my teacher at the Garfield. And I and I, I know Joe's alive, but other than that, I don't actually know how many would be alive. Uh, but yeah, I would I would love as many of my you know former teachers, friends, people that I hang around with, people that I knew but didn't know me all that well. I mean, I just think it'd be a fun day and mm -hmm. an interesting day, and it'd be good to see all these people I haven't seen in years. Yeah, great. Well, I'm I'm glad that you agreed to do this here in Revere because I'm really hoping to. Um, expand the adult programming. You know, it broke my heart that you've been to all these other libraries, including the one where I live in Bill Recca, and I wasn't able to attend. And um, unfortunately, the library is so small that, you know, that, that's why we agreed to do it at the Rumley Marsh Academy. And, and I, I want to thank the, the, the Revere School Department for letting us, letting us do that, to use their auditorium at the Rumney Marsh Academy. So it's um, Saturday, September 6th from 2 to 4, I believe it was? Yes. Yes, 2 to 4. Um, your books are available uh, at Barnes and Noble and Amazon, Apple, Google, and other major online retailers. Kobo, and uh, if you go to my website, um, www. you can get more information about them up there as well. Okay, great. Well, thank you for ha for coming. Thank you, Kevin. I appreciate it, and I look forward to seeing you on the sixth. Same here.